Greetings, everyone. My name is Amal Matu, and I'm faculty here at University of Maryland, and welcome to our Crashing Patient Conference. For those of you that are interested in getting CME credit for the lectures that you're going to see, you can get CME credit on EMED Home. Check it out at www.emedhome.com. And for those people that want live lectures, we're going to be right back here in October of 2013. Hope to see you then. Hi, my name is Haney Malamat. I'd like to talk to you about the crashing ventilated patient and how you can go from zero to hero. Here's where we're going to go today. We're going to talk about two clinical situations. The first one is the patient who you intubate and you have to start resuscitating. And the second case is a case where you have bad ventilation on your patient as well as hypotension. So let's start off with the first one, the patient you intubate and resuscitate. And here's a case to get us going. This is a 99-year-old female who's coming in with fever and dyspnea, who has a history of hypertension, congestive heart failure, and COPD. She's clearly in respiratory distress, and you can tell just by looking at her and her mucous membranes, she's clinically dry. Her heart rate is 98, which is a normal sinus rhythm. Her blood pressure is 105 over 56. She's febrile. Her SAT is 83% on room air. And here's your chest x-ray. And right off the bat, you know what you have to do. It's time to intubate. You put the sedative of your choice, as well as your paralytic. You start to bag up the patient to pre-oxygenate. And you place the patient on the ventilator. And there's your blood pressure. This is the look on my face. And this is how big I feel when everyone is looking at me, how I almost killed this patient. So let's summarize this case. This is an old patient who's sick and dry. So let's talk about how you manage pa patients that you intubate and you have to resuscitate. Now, old patients at baseline have little cardiopulmonary reserve. They may have at baseline cardiac disease. They may have weakened systolic or diastolic function. They, all may, they may also have a reduction in their pulmonary um, reserve as well as their pulmonary function. They're also on medications. They're on antihypertensive medications that might blunt their response to a critical illness. They may also be on diuretics that decrease their preload. And then older patients have altered pharmacokinetics. This can come in the form of liver or kidney disease and make it unpredictable on how the medications, how they're going to react to the medications we administer to them. Patients that are ill also have a reduced cardiopulmonary reserve. They may have cardiac dysfunction from the disease themselves, or the illness, in this case, such as pneumonia, might actually affect the patient's respiratory um, reserve. The illness may directly affect their end organs, such as renal insufficiency, and the patient might be acidotic, whether it's a metabolic acidosis from the illness or it's a respiratory acidosis from pulmonary dysfunction. And acidosis is bad in itself but it also increases the risks of arrhythmias, which further complicate management of these patients. Patients that are dry have reduced preload. People that are sick take less PO intake. They also sweat, they're vomiting, they're having diarrhea. This all decreases their effective intravascular volume. They may have vasodilation from the illness, and they may have leaky capillaries that decrease their intravascular volume and cause them to third space. Now, the body's response to this is to increase sympathetic drive. Our body tries to mitigate these responses by increasing our heart rate and our stroke volume to increase our cardiac output. We also increase our systemic vascular resistance to shunt blood from less critical areas to the heart and the brain. And we also become more tachypnic because we have acidosis, we increase our respiratory drive and decrease our CO2 as a mechanism of compensation. So what we do when we give our assigned meds is we cause sympathetolysis, and we decrease our sympathetic drive. The meds themselves can cause vasodilation. Because we lose that sympathetic tone, we get bradycardia. That offsets our reflex increase in cardiac output. And patients can slow down their respiratory drive that can make the patients more acidotic. 
And when we bag our patients, we have to remember that the ventilations must be just right. If we bag the patients during RSI too slow, we can make them acidotic. Patients are compensating by breathing faster during their illness, and when we give them the medications, they lose that respiratory drive, and if we don't bag them properly, they can be more acidotic. Similarly, if we breathe them too fast, we can decrease the venous inflow into the right heart and thus cardiac output. So we have to find the perfect rate of ventilation for these patients, and it can be a very difficult thing to do when our patients are very sick. Placing these patients on the vent, giving them mechanical ventilation, we're increasing their intrathoracic pressure with this positive pressure ventilation. Increased intrathoracic pressure decreases preload by compressing the great veins returning to the right heart. We're also increasing the right ventricular afterload, making it harder for that right ventricle to squeeze blood into the left ventricle and increase our cardiac output. The positive pressure also decreases left ventricular compliance, making the heart stiffer. A stiffer heart means it's harder for the heart to fill, decrease filling, decrease cardiac output. These things all compound together to hurt our patients who are critically ill. So let's go back and review case one. This is our 98-year-old lady who is in respiratory distress with a clear pneumonia who dropped her blood pressure after intubation. So the first lesson is what to do with the patient that you intubate and have to resuscitate. Remember, if your patient is old, they're sick, and they're dry, remember these three things. When you're giving RSI medications, especially the sedatives, cut your dose in half. You can always give more if your patient doesn't respond, but remember the characteristics of the old, sick, and dry patient. They may have a different response to our normal patients with these medications, and you don't want to bottom out their pressure. The second thing to remember is if you have time, place an arterial line in your patients. These patients can rapidly fall off the hemodynamic cliff, and you'd like to know exactly when they become hypotensive to institute resuscitative measures. So if you have the time and the means, place an arterial line. And the last thing to remember is bolus dose pressures. Let's go into this a little bit more. Bolus dose pressures are drugs that you're going to give through a peripheral IV to increase blood pressure. They're very titratable. You can get them to the effect that you need, and you give them in small doses. And they're also safe should, you ha should they happen to extravasate into the um, peripheral tissues. The two drugs we'll describe are phenylephrine and epinephrine. Phenylephrine, our pure alpha agonist, comes in vials of 10 milligrams. The way you mix it up is like this. You take the 10 milligrams, or 10,000 micrograms, and you put it into a 100 ml bag of normal saline. You shake it up. Take a 10 cc syringe and draw out all 10 cc's from that bag that you just mixed up. What you're going to have in that syringe is 1,000 micrograms of phenylephrine, and each cc is going to have 100 micrograms. You can administer neo or phenylephrine by giving one to two cc's every three to five minutes. Each dose is going to be 100 to 200 micrograms. The effect should be within a minute and it'll last up to 20 minutes. And one of the best things about phenylephrine is that if you find that you have to place a central line, you can take that bag that you just mixed up and run it peripherally in their IV until you can get a central line for more definitive care. Should you use epinephrine, you're going to take the 1 in 10,000 concentration from the code cart. This has 1 milligram per 10 mLs. You're going to take 1 mL out of that, out of that premixed vial, and you're going to put it into a 10 cc syringe. The rest of that volume is going to be 9 cc's of normal saline, so you'll have a total volume of 10 cc's. Again, 1 cc is going to be that 1 in 10,000 concentration, and the other 9 cc's are going to be normal saline. Now you're going to have 10 micrograms per ml dilution. What you're going to do is you're going to take half a cc to 2 cc's and push it every 3 to 5 minutes. This is going to be 5 to 20 micrograms per push. The effect occurs within a minute and lasts up to 10 minutes. And we won't discuss it here, but there are ways that you can mix this up as a drip and also run it peripherally until you can get a central line in for definitive care. So remember this, if you have an old, a sick, or clinically dry patient, remember these three things when you're about to intubate.
take your sedative medication and cut the dose in half. Remember, older patients, sick patients, and dry patients have a very different metabolism with these medications, and you don't want to bottom out their blood pressure. The second thing is if you have the time and you have the means, place an arterial line for careful arterial blood pressure monitoring. You want to know exactly when that patient becomes hypotensive on you so you can begin your resuscitation. You don't want to wait for that cuff to cycle over and find out that you've been waiting three or four minutes with a hypotensive patient. And the final thing is before intubation, remember to draw up your bolus dose pressures to have them ready should your patient tank on you. So that's what you do with the patient that you have to intubate and then resuscitate. Let's move on to a different case, the patient who has bad ventilation with hypotension. So this is a case of a 31-year-old male who comes in with a severe asthma attack and is somnolent on presentation. No x-ray is needed, no labs are needed, you know exactly what to do. You're looking at the cords and you're intubating that patient. Everyone is so impressed with your skills, everyone's high-fiving, and you head back to your desk to start to work on your lunch. Just as you're about to take your first bite, the nurse comes over and says, hold on now, we have a problem. The patient's blood pressure is low and the alarm is making all sorts of funny sounds. We need you. Well, you go up to the ventilator, you go up to the patient, and you just can't figure out what's going on. Too many things are going on, on the screen, there's too many sounds, and you can't figure out why this patient has low blood pressure. Well, let's take a look at this. The most common reason for this patient's low blood pressure is hyperinflation of the lungs. Hyperinflation really hurts hemodynamics. You'll recall we discussed what increases in intrathoracic pressure do to your hemodynamic status. You decrease your preload with a high intrathoracic pressure or hyperinflation by decreasing venous return to the right side of the heart. Decreasing venous return to the right side of the heart means decreased filling of the right heart. Decreased filling of the right heart means decreased filling of the left heart. And with, re with decreased filling of the left heart, you have a reduction in your cardiac output. Increased intrathoracic pressure from hyperinflation also reduces the compliance of your left heart. And now you have a stiffer ventricle that can't fill as well. If it can't fill as well, it can't pump out as well. And finally, a hyperinflated lung increases your RV afterload, increasing the pressure that your RV has to work against, thus decreasing the filling of your left ventricle and decreasing your cardiac output. Now, hyperinflation is also bad for the lung and ventilation in general. Although you may not see it at the time, barotrauma can be created by stretch of the lung. This ventilator-induced lung injury, or VILI, can be something that we see down the road for patients um, when they're in the ICU. We also hyperinflate the lung, and we have reduction in compliance of the lung. The lung is, again, stiffer, and it becomes harder to ventilate these patients that are hyperinflated. And we also increase the dead space of our patient, further limiting our ability to ventilate this patient properly. So here's lesson number two. Here's the mnemonic that you're going to use to work around patients like this. Remember the mnemonic, dopes like dots. Dopes is going to help you figure out your differential diagnosis for this patient as you approach them. And dots is going to help you treat and troubleshoot the problems. So let's start off with the first part, diagnosing the problem. Remember the mnemonic, dopes. D is going to stand for a displaced, dislodged tube or a cuff leak with your tube. O is going to stand for an obstructed tube. P stands for a pneumothorax. E stands for equipment malfunction or a disconnected circuit. And S is going to stand for stacking of the breaths. So each one of these is a potential cause for your ventilator problem. Let's go into a little bit more detail about stacking because this may be a new concept for some people. Breath stacking is also known as intrinsic PEEP. It's also known as dynamic hyperinflation or auto PEEP. Basically what happens is this is an expiratory problem. You take a breath in, you fill up the lungs, but you can't get all the air out. So if you put 500 cc's of air into the lungs, let's say only 250 come out. That means there's 250 left in. Your next breath, you put another 500 in, and now you can't get that out, and now you have 500 cc's left. And the problem compounds as you dynamically hyperinflate this lung, 
and it gets harder and harder not only to get air in, but this can also affect the hemodynamic status of the patient. This happens commonly in asthma or COPD where you have smaller airways that don't permit the air to expire out. This can happen if you're aggressively ventilating a patient, whether it's with a bag valve mask or a ventilator. So if you're providing a high respiratory rate and putting a lot of air in, but not giving the time for the air to come out, you can have this dynamic hyperinflation. Patients can also do this to themselves by having the sensation of air hunger. If a patient has the sensation that they need to take a breath, they may trigger the ventilator to give them a breath. And this, this breath might be uh, administered before the patient can get the previous breath out, leading to dynamic hyperinflation of the lung. If you look at a flow time tracing, here you have a patient who's taking a breath in, and the breath is coming out, and then they go to expire their breath, and it comes back to baseline. This is what happens normally. The breath comes back to baseline. But look what happens with a patient who has auto -peep. At the end of every expiration, there's still some air left in, and the, the expiration doesn't come back to baseline. This is the problem. So how are we going to fix the problem? Well, remember the mnemonic D-O-T-T-S, or DOTS. D stands for disconnect the patient from the ventilator. O stands for put the patient on 100% O2 and bag valve mask the patient. T is going to be checking the tube position and checking the function of the tube, the integrity. T stands for tweak the vent. And S is going to be to use sonogram or ultrasound to help figure out your problem. So here's step one. Immediately go ahead and disconnect your patient from the ventilator. The next step, and this should take no more than 10 seconds, is to gently place both your hands on the patient's anterior chest and slowly push down and compress the lungs. Listen to the endotracheal tube, and if you hear a hissing sound, this suggests that there was air trapped inside the lungs with dynamic hyperinflation. At the end of the 10-second maneuver, go ahead and hook the patient up to 100% and start bagging them. You all want to avoid excessive bagging because too much bagging can compound the problem and lead to more auto peep, and you don't want to breathe too slow because that can lead to acidosis. Give the patient exactly what they need. While you're bagging, you should be look, looking, listening, and feeling the patient. You want to look at the patient. You want to look at the position of the tube. After you pass the tube, the respiratory therapist makes note of what level the tube is at. Check to see if the tube is still at the same position as when you placed the tube initially. Did it migrate? Did it go in further? Did it get main stemmed? Did it come out? Did it go above the cords? The tube itself, is it kinked? Sometimes you can see this. And is the patient just biting on the tube? Maybe the patient needs more sedation or paralysis in the extreme cases. Look at the patient's chest. Is the chest rising at all? If it is, is it rising symmetrically? You want to listen to your patient. Put your head and your ear next to the patient's nose and mouth and listen to hear if there's an air leak in the circuit as you're bagging. Maybe the pilot balloon is down. Maybe it's ruptured. You want to then auscultate your patient, listening for equal breath sounds. You also want to make note if there's a prolonged expiratory phase. A prolonged expiratory phase goes along with dynamic hyperinflation or auto peep. Then you want to feel the patient. First, you want to feel the bag as you're bagging. Is it easy or hard? If, the bag, if it's very easy to bag the patient, it suggests that maybe the tube is above the cords and you're in the hypopharynx. If it's hard to bag, perhaps there's a main stem intubation or perhaps there's a pneumothorax. You also want to squeeze the pilot balloon to see if there's, a, if there's a rupture in the cuff. The next is to palpate the patient's chest to feel if there's any crepitus, suggesting any pneumothorax. Next, you want to focus on the tube. Is there a blockage in the tube? This can come in the form of mucus, kink, or did the tube just get dislodged? You can pass a suction catheter down to see if there's any resistance. You can do the same thing with a bougie, or if you have the availability of it, you can look with a fiber optic scope to look down and see if there's any obstruction along the length of the tube. If there's any doubt at all, don't delay and give the patient some sedation and do direct laryngoscopy to ensure that the tube is in place. The next step is to tweak the vent. 
you want to check the settings that are on the ventilator now. Are they the same settings that you started out with, or did someone come by and change them? Try to track this down and try to figure out why someone would change your settings. The next step is to go and check the waveform that's displayed on the screen. And we already spent some time talking about dynamic hyperinflation. But you'll recall, this is a situation where the expiratory volume is not, the expiratory flow is not coming back to baseline. And so if there's stacking, you have to identify first whether or not this is reversible. If it's a case of asthma or COPD, does this person need more nebulization, some more medical treatment? If the person is having air hunger and triggering the vent on their own, perhaps they need to be sedated more. And if the patient cannot be sedated adequately, perhaps you need to do paralysis temporarily to get yourself out of this bind. If you start tweaking the vent, things you should think about, if you have auto peep, is to reduce the tidal volume. Giving the patient smaller tidal volumes is going to decrease the amount of air that you're putting into the thorax, helping the problem. Something that might help the patient even more is to decrease the respiratory rate. By decreasing the respiratory rate, you're increasing the amount of expiratory time that the patient has to get the air flow out. Another way you can do this is to increase the flow of air coming into the patient's chest. So by increasing the flow, you're decreasing the inspiratory time, the time it takes to get the same volume of air into the chest. Therefore, you're increasing the expiratory time allowing more air to exit the chest. So after you make tweaks to the vent, and in this case, we're decreasing the respiratory rate, we're allowing more time for that air that was trapped inside the lung to get back to baseline, and we're reversing the problem. One thing to remember is that patients who are very acidotic or hypercarbic or have increased intracranial pressure might be at risk of worsening should you do this maneuver. The patient to really worry about is the patient with intracranial pressure because by decreasing the rate, you're allowing this person to permissively become hypercapnic. This will dilate the cerebral veins and increase intracranial pressure. So use extreme caution and know your patients before you do this maneuver. The last step is to use ultrasound to help you diagnose the problem. We can look for pneumothoraces, we can look for mainstem intubations, we can look for mucus plugs, and we can look for pleural effusions, all using ultrasound post-intubation. We're going to focus a little bit on pneumothorax because that's something that most people have already trained. And so here's an example of someone who has a left pneumothorax. And you'll recall, in normal circumstances, our visceral and parietal pleura, when we breathe, slide up against each other. And this can be illustrated in this ultrasound clip. Here we have skin, subcutaneous tissue, some muscle, we have a rib and a rib, and here at the pleural line we see artifact created when the visceral and parietal pleura are sliding up against each other. This is a normal lung. Well if we have a situation where we have a pneumothorax, the, the visceral pleura comes off the parietal pleura, and now we have a situation where the right lung still has sliding at the pleural line. But if we go to this situation over here on the left chest, we see that there's no sliding at all. This, be, this may be more clearly seen if we add MO to the evaluation, where we see the normal seashore sign here, where we have movement at the pleural line. And over here, we see more of the barcode or stratosphere sign and the side that has the pneumothorax. So to summarize, remember the mnemonic dopes like dots. Dopes will help you diagnose your problem and dots will help you to treat your problem and troubleshoot the patient at the bedside. D stands for a displaced dislodged tube or a cuff leak. O stands for an obstructed tube. N stands for pneumothorax, E stands for equipment failure or disconnect, and S stands for breath stacking. Think about these things as a potential cause of your problem. And then remember the mnemonic DOTS. Remember to disconnect the patient from the ventilator and gently push on the chest for about 10 seconds. O stands for put the patient on O2 and then bag the patient. Check tube position and check function. You want to remember to tweak your vent. 
you want to decrease your respiratory rate or your tidal volume or decrease your eye time, all those maneuvers are going to increase the amount of time you have during expiration. And finally, don't forget about sonography or ultrasound to help you figure out what's going on with the patient. Remember when you have the case of a patient who you intubate and you have to resuscitate. Remember, if your patients are old, they're sick, or they're dry, remember these three things. Whatever medication you use for sedation during RSI, cut it in half. You can always add more medication back, but you can't take it away if you drop their pressure. If you have the time or the means, place an arterial line so you can carefully monitor their blood pressure during intubation. And finally, before you push those medications for RSI, make sure you have some bolus dose pressures ready should their blood pressure drop. Whether it's phenylephrine or epinephrine, have them ready to go. And don't forget about the situation where you have bad ventilation and hypotension. Remember hyperinflation could be behind this. And remember the mnemonic, dopes like dots. Dopes helps you with the differential, and dots helps you to treat the problem. We have various causes that could be causing the hyperinflation. And remember the algorithm to go through stepwise to try and fix that problem. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and don't hesitate to email me with any questions that you have. Thank you very much.